Welcome to the Predictable Revenue Podcast, where frontline sales leaders teach you how to build and scale an outbound sales team. Welcome back to the Predictable Revenue Podcast. I'm your host, Colin Stewart. Today, I'm joined by Curran Singh. He's the he's a strategic advisor and co-founder at this firm that you you might have heard of, um, but you've probably heard of their pr- probably heard of his co-founder because he was on the show, Lars Nelson. He uh, he did a great episode with Aaron and myself, sort of talking about the future of sales, and that's how Curran and I got hooked up because. I've been a big fan of you know Salesforce and what you guys do for quite a while. I remember seeing, I think it was Lars's presentation at Saster. I want to say it's 2015, and I've learned since that that was like a thrown together kind of last minute presentation on everything you guys were doing using outreach, how you're personalizing, and I, just, I remember everybody talking about personalizing your 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 outreach and personalizing this, personalizing that. And a lot of it was, I just felt was like lip service. And then when I saw Lars doing, I was like, oh, like this is a huge team that's actually being really successful. And so I, I've always had a lot of respect for Lars. And then I learned that Curran was actually one of the guys behind all that. So I thought, hey, be great to have him on the show. So Curran, thanks so much for joining us today. You got it, Colin. Happy to be here. Great, man. So today we're going to talk about not, not just the, you know, my crush on Lars. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk, we're going to talk about sort of your data-driven approach to go-to-market planning. Um, first, I'd love to hear just any, yeah, tell me about your time at, at Cloudera. How did, you, how did you get there? What was it like? Um, yeah. And then I, I think we've got a story to sort of transition into the rest of the episode. Yeah, sure. So, so you said you have a crush on Lars. I'd, I'd say I do too. I've been working with the guy for 10 years now. So uh, God knows I keep coming back um, and there's <laughs> for it. And it's funny. So about five years ago, Lars and I were building out our consulting firm, SalesSource. That's actually when we, we first co-founded it and we were working with a variety of firms in the Valley. It was interesting, it was exciting, finding a lot of different use cases. And then our uh, CEO from ArcSite, which was the first company he and I worked together at, Lars and I did, came back out of the blue and said, hey, I'm going to go run uh, uh, Cloudera. I'll be the CEO there and I need my old lieutenants back. And so, you know, you don't say no to that. It was a great ride the first time. So we went and did it again. And uh, it was great because uh, when I was at ArcSite years and years back, uh, I was working with Lars. Lars was running the field operations function. And then when I joined Cloudera, I was fortunate Lars went more towards the inside sales route where you hear a lot about ABSD and all the great personalization and work we've done there. And I got to spend a lot more of my time and focus building out the sales operations function. And as you know, that's, I mean, that's the backbone, Colin, right? That's how you go build out a strong, you know, outbound strategy. That's how you make sure you set up your systems and your organization, your sales organization to scale. So, when, we jo- when I joined, when we joined, it was a $35 million run rate company. By the time I left, uh, we took it all the way to a public event. And post-public event, we were able to uh, make it a sustainable organization that's still doing great things today. So got to see all the warts and whistles along the way as we, we grew the organization. And uh, hopefully some of that I can translate to this conversation today. Yeah, man, that's got to be cool. How many, what, how many SDRs did you guys have at peak? Boy, at peak, and this was a worldwide SDR organization, I'd say we were well over 60 to 70. Um, But keep in mind, you know, one of the things we were really mindful of is that that sales revenue generating or activity generating individuals, they need a lot of support around them. They need the right, what I refer to as the right coverage model around them. So yes, we had 60 plus SDRs in place, we had ISRs in place, but we also had a strong enablement function supporting them. We had dedicated operations supporting them. We had the right rules of engagement. So the point being that, I mean, it was a massive sales organization, even from an inside sales and SDR perspective, and we did all the right things for it, I think. So so maybe give give us some, some perspective on the size of the total sales org then. 500 plus. Uh, and again, for us, so I don't know how much you know about Cloudera, but Cloudera is a highly technical sale. And mm-hmm. a lot of companies out there, it's not like I can give you a demo of a data warehouse. Not really. It's a little bit of an abstract concept, right? Yeah. So for us, we employed a lot of that challenger methodology. It's coming in and helping clients, helping organizations think through why they would want something like a Cloudera in place, helping them, helping them think about the pain points more so than the technical solution. 
Then once we got that alignment in place, then it was bringing in the sales engineers, the subject matter experts, the business value consultants. There's these massive six-legged sales cycles we would run for six to nine months. And so, yes, our sales organization in terms of revenue generators was maybe 200 some odd people, but then we had just as many, you know, about a hundred plus SEs. We had many business value consultants and all these infrastructure reps, as I refer to them, supporting that sales team and helping them be successful. Um, it was a it was an arduous sales cycle, but God, you learn a lot about what it takes to sell an open source solution and actually sell <laughs> something that's free. Yeah, it's really technical as well. So uh, I always like to say I. I got a PhD in sales operations while I was at Cloud Era because, man, you see every single type of problem pop up uh, during my four and a half years there. Man, you got some good stories. I bet you we could just spend a whole couple hours just talking about war stories from Cloud Era. All the scars in the trenches, exactly. <laughs> cool. I know there's one particular um, event that you guys, you sort of struggle with um, sort of around, you know, defining your target market and maybe not doing it when you should have. You want to tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I, sure. And I, I'd say to start, if I, and this is how I always like to tell my team this as well, when I think about a sales operations function and what we do, right, there's a planning side, there's the execution side, right? And planning to me is one of the most important parts of what an operator can do. If you do that part right, the execution gets a lot easier, right? And within planning, defining your target market is right at the top of the list of things you need to go ahead and do. The problem is most companies miss out on this in, in, in two particular ways. Number one, they think it's a relatively complex exercise. It's one that, you know, uh, really can't figure out. Everyone's a snowflake. Um, uh, so let's not worry too much about it. Let's just go after the largest companies in the world. And I think that I can understand why that premise is in place, but there is a methodology. And we'll talk about some of that today as to how you can be very um, sort of systematic about defining your target market. And then the second thing is, companies aren't really thoughtful about continuing to iterate on their target market, right? It, it's almost perceived as a one-time activity that happens at the start of when you're building out your sales function for the first time, and then you just sit on that for the foreseeable future. The reality is both things aren't true. And it's something that I learned from being in the trenches. And that's uh, one of the challenges and the pains that we felt as we, we grew Cloud Era. And, and the story is, so when I first joined, $35 million run rate. Um, so big, but not big, right? It was heading in the right direction. Um, and our presumption was, hey, what is our target market? Well, we don't have a lot of data to pr prove or disprove anything. Let's just make it the global 2000, the biggest companies in the world, which I think was fair, right? It was a good starting point. But what happened was from that $35 million run rate, one year later, we'd gone from a sales team of 20 people to 100 people. And from 100 people the year after to 200 people. When you're scaling that rapidly in terms of headcount, in terms of revenue targets, things like that, you want to be thoughtful about expanding your target market as needed. We didn't do that. Instead, we let what I refer to, we let the inmates run the asylum. In other words, we had our sales team coming back to us and saying, hey, these are the accounts that we think are target accounts. Oh, it's not a global 2000 account, but we think it's a target account. Why did they think it was a target account? Because candidly, it was easier for them to get than maybe a you know, Coca-Cola, for instance. So they were worried about their, uh, their targets. They were worried about their comp plan, but they weren't thinking about the company as a whole. Two and a half years later, we're in a point where we're thinking about, hey, we want to go public. We need to file an S1. We need to do all those things. And as you can imagine, when you're going down that path, going down investor roadshows and whatnot, you have to explain what your target market is. You have to help people understand why you're viable for the long term. So then we started doing a deeper analysis. Hey, the target market that we put in place, is that the right target market? Through some even cursory data analysis, we realized, Colin, that half the pipeline that we had generated in our business for the upcoming year was for the wrong set of accounts. And by wrong set of accounts, I mean the accounts that would take $100,000 of our effort and our spend and our sales rep time to generate maybe $50,000 of lifetime spend. So net, net, and net negative for us. And we had no idea because we just didn't put the thoughtfulness. We didn't iterate on the target market. We didn't do all those things early days. Once we realized how important it was, of course, we doubled down on it. We involved data science. We put in regression analysis, all this crazy stuff that helped us be very thoughtful about how we 
sort of rudder the ship for the sales organization. But that was a very painful learning pretty late into the cycle within Cloud Era. And again, it's been tattooed on my heart and my brain. And it's something that I always espouse to all the companies that I consult with now because it certainly was uh, impactful for us. I can't, I can't imagine the the feeling of disappointment when you, your sales org realizes that, you know, you work, you're working your ass off to hit these targets. You're driving, you're driving, you're driving, only to realize at the end of the year that, you know, the company spent a hundred grand to make 50 grand. Yeah. And uh, on the other side of it too, how do you change that at that point? Right? So think about it this way, right? By the time we figured out this issue, our pipeline was in the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars of pipeline. So when I say 50% of pipeline, I'm saying hundreds of millions of dollars of pipeline that was in the wrong location. So how do you go to your sales organization and say, let's just go butcher that pipeline. That's not where we want you to focus, right? There's no, there's no revolutionary way for you to, um, to change that. It has to be evolutionary. So it took time and energy and patience for us to now re reorient ourselves as a sales organization. I would say, defining that target market, right? That is the rudder of your ship. If your sales organization is a ship, the target market is the rudder. So if your ship is a Titanic, which is basically what we were at by the time we got to the size we did, right? Re sort of orienting us was a pretty arduous task. And it's something that, you know, I'm sure we're still going through at this point, but uh, uh, certainly impactful. Man, I I'm, I can't imagine, you know, if I was a, a company doing you know, $5 million, you know, sitting there going, you know, maybe this doesn't apply to me. We're not, we're not, you know, at $35 million trying to do $200 million. You know, what do you, what do you say to that sort of argument? Yeah, I, um, I would say that the mistake that we made was that we thought the same thing when we started, which is that we don't need to worry about the target market. It's not hyper relevant to us right now. We're just going in for a land grab and we're just trying to make some basic uh, do some dollars right now, right? Um, and, and by doing it that way, I think we did ourselves a disservice because uh, we weren't thoughtful from day one. Had we been thoughtful from day one, and it's not about just being able to put the line in the sand at $5 million and saying, this is our target market. It's about putting in the cadence and the methodology to continue to iterate your target market from early days. Had we done that from the beginning, I think we would have been better off. And that would be my recommendation. If, And by the way, Colin, I do this now, right? As a consultant, as a co-founder at Salesforce, I'm going into younger companies now and applying some of the same principle I've learned, principles I've learned as I've grown sales organizations for these massive companies and applying it to these younger companies. And the message I give them is the same, is think about where you want to be in two to five years back into that today in terms of the methodologies you'd want to apply then, the questions you'd want to answer then when you're a hundred million dollar run rate company, think about them now. Set up the infrastructure, set up the cadence, the thought process today to get there. That's the only way you will because otherwise you end up with guys like me coming in on a hundred million dollar company and above where folks are saying, boy, we everything's messed up. Our infrastructure isn't ready. We don't know how to, et cetera, et cetera. And then it becomes a much heavier lift. The timing, timing wise, where do, where do you think this is best? Cause if we're, if I'm a small startup of just two people, mm -hmm. you know, we don't have, or maybe we just have product market fit, mm -hmm. you know, this sounds like a huge burden. Maybe it's the right product exercise we should be doing. If I, if I'm a $10 million company scaling up my sales team, it feels like it's too late. So where, where's the, when is the right time? Yeah, I think it, it really depends on the what as well as the when. So in other words, when you're thinking about a target market and defining it, I think early stage companies go about that methodology differently, right? You have to do it in a very qualitative fashion versus mid-stage and late stage companies might be doing it in more of a data-driven sort of retroactive fashion. So in other words, looking back historically and saying, are we right with respect to our hypotheses? So I think it depends first of all in terms of the level of maturity of the company and the amount of data you have available. That being said, I think the qualitative analysis of defining your target market, which is more of a conversation, more of a workshop that you do with key stakeholders in the company, you got to do that right at the beginning, right at the beginning when you're thinking through building out your sales organization. That there's no, there's no dependency, no limit to you being able to do that other than just bringing the right folks into a room and having the right framework to have a conversation around. Um, so that, I mean, do that from right at the beginning when you're first starting to build out your go-to-market function, first trying to think about what your product market fit is. 
Because guess what, Colin? It will also inform your product, your marketing team, your engineering team as to how they should be thinking about the products they're building, the demand gen activities they're doing, all those things. It's not a purely sales activity. This is more comprehensive than that. 100% agree. I've, I've spent most of my life as, as a sales rep or managing a sales team. And when I started the, this company seven years ago, I started learning about product because that was my biggest weakness. And I started to realize that the sales and pro being a sales rep and a product manager are very, very similar roles in terms of what you're doing in terms of, mm -hmm. or at least running a sales team. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of great, you know, product teams, they have to start with these fundamentals, which is the market, the customer, the sort of pain that you're serving. Like obviously the cut, the product idea came from somewhere and hopefully it was validated. Right? And yeah. that's ideally the genesis of a company. Right, so chances are your company's already done a lot of this, and I, I, maybe it's just the organizations I'd worked in. But I found, like, as a salesperson, I ended up doing a lot of this myself for the first time. And I was like, "This hasn't been done before." Okay, no, yeah. you know, yeah. I read some books. Um, so, talk to me about when you. So, how do you define a target market? Yeah, and uh, I think I was alluding to it a little bit earlier, and you actually made a good comment as well that as a salesperson, you were kind of doing this accidentally yourself too. Um, and I think it all kind of correlates with each other. So let me give you my worldview of how I think about defining the target market. I think it's not this broad conversation about what does a target market look like, like candidly we did early days, which is, oh, biggest companies in the world. That's a little bit of a crutch, right? That's the easy uh, approach. And to be honest, when I was at ArcSight, we did the same thing, right? Early days, it was just the biggest companies in the world. That's easy for enterprise companies, but it's not comprehensive. So instead, what I like to do is I like to take my teams down the path of not necessarily defining a target market, Colin, but defining what's referred to as an ICP or an ideal customer profile. Let's go figure out the type of accounts, the type of customers you have today or the type of customers you're looking for today that would be quote unquote ideal, as well as the inverse, the ones that you would sit there and say, boy, we really don't want these individuals as our customers, right? If you can be really thoughtful about defining those two categories, then it becomes a lot easier to go down the path of building out a target market, right? Because there's a lot of technologies out there today what and what they do, these are curated databases. You see this with Discover or DNB, Everstream. There, there's a few different ones out there which do what are called like accounts matching. So in other words, I can go to these companies and say, here's my list of ideal customers. Can you find me other ones that are like this? Which is, if you think about it, for a curated database, that's a relatively easy exercise. So going from an ICP to a target market is actually relatively easy and it's been something that's been automated. The piece that hasn't necessarily been automated today, Colin, is the first half, which is defining your ICP. And I think that's a hard thing to automate because it is more conversational in the beginning anyhow. And so my, my approach is let's get the right stakeholders in a room. Let's have them think through what their ideal customer profile is through a framework that I've, I've, I've used in the past as well, I'll share in this, uh, this podcast as well. And let's put that in place first and foremost, and then let's go translate that over to a target market. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So talk to me about who's in, who's in that room, right? Because I, I think that's one thing that, you know, maybe we've experienced as, as salespeople is like, we're, we tend not to be in the room. And I remember the conversation with Lars, you know, his, his, one of the big takeaways was, you know, sales development deserves a seat at that table and the, the table being the theoretical senior management table. Yeah, I, uh, I think you hit it right on the head. The converse, so the piece that you want to avoid is living in an echo chamber, right? So how does that happen? That happens when you have, say, a bunch of operators sitting in a room defining a target market. I tell you what the target market is. You agree with me because you haven't seen anything aside from what I've seen. And therefore, we're in that echo chamber and we walk out thinking we figured it out. And turns out it's not relevant to anyone else. So you have to be really mindful of that. My simple list, because again, you can't have 20 people in a room doing this, right? You're never gonna get consensus or any progression. My simple list is really, there's three categories, three functions that I care about that need to be in there. Sales, marketing, and lesser known, and I'll explain why, but finance as well, okay? From a sales perspective, because there's subgroups underneath this, from a sales perspective, you definitely want your sales operations leader in there, right? And because that's the person that's kind of that's usually me and I'm the one who's kind of program managing that and kind of putting all the pieces together, right? Self-serving here, Karen. 
<laughs> yeah, what do you say? <laughs> exactly. Uh, I had to throw that in. So it's usually a sales operator, right? You want your sales leader in there because they've got a good pulse of the business and they have an understanding in both, both worlds, both execution, but also thinking through comprehensively what the company's requirements and goals are. But I am, I'm a big believer in having individual, at least one individual contributor from a sales perspective in that room. Somebody who's been in the trenches, somebody who's living in on a day-to-day -day basis in the sales process, speaking with customers, seeing the good, bad, and the ugly. Somebody who can give that sort of anecdotal evidence to us. Hugely important to have that person in there as well. Because so, I think everything else is just theory, right? Unless you have somebody who's actually, you know, taken the, the talk tracks or your scripts or your templates and and throwing them in front of customers. How do you know, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, if you think about it, that's the person that, especially in the beginning, when you don't have a lot of data to back up your findings, is the one that's gonna be the, the driving factor in helping you define your ICP. Now, our job is to pressure test, right? If you tell me that you're the individual contributor and you tell me that I believe FinServe is financial services are key uh, for us and our ideal customer profile, I'm going to do everything in my power to prove you wrong, but that's because, again, that's that, 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 that positive sort of dissonance that happens between us to get to that ideal state. So again, from a sales perspective, hugely important to have that individual contributor as well. From a marketing standpoint, having both product marketing, but also demand gen in this conversation, hugely valuable. Product marketing, obviously, because this individual is really helping guide the overall content strategy of the organization and how we're going to market from a marketing perspective. But demand gen, those are the individuals, it's like sales operations, right? They're at the tip of the spear from a marketing perspective. They're helping bring the inbound lead flow in to, uh, to, to support the sales team. We want to make sure that we're mindful of their expectations, their understanding of the target market as well. And oh, by the way, once we define that target market, they're going to need to be just as involved on, on the front end at the top of the funnel in helping us get the right set of leads in. So hugely important to have both of those individuals in. And then finally, and I get a little bit of back and forth on this when I, when I suggest finance, but I think finance is huge in this conversation. Not because they're going to be the ones that sit here and tell you that, uh, you know, these are the companies that you think you should, we should sell to because I believe it's industry X or Y or Z. They're not going to be that individual, but what they will do is they'll help you understand the corporate objectives. So for us at Cloudera, our finance team came back and said, look, here are the things we care about. Current. We care about net expansion rate, so how fast our customers grow their revenue year over year. We care about renewal churn, so uh, making sure we don't lose not just customers, but dollars for existing customers. And then we care about new logo land grab in the following different categories, for instance. Why do they care about those things? Because they have expectations to report to the board, they have expectations to report externally, all those things. So we want to be very mindful of what what I refer to as what measures they care about, because that's also going to help drive our ICP analysis. So as long as you have those individuals in a, in a, in a group setting, and that's maybe five to seven individuals, something along those lines, I think you can get a very healthy conversation going and defining that ICP. So that's the who, Colin. The other half of the equation is the how, right? What are the questions you ask? What is a framework, right? And that's where operators like myself are really leading the conversation in this analysis. That's great, man. And I love, I love how you're sort of, we're getting everybody in the room. So it's not just these conversations about theories or what should be or how we want it to be. It's, we want to talk about what are, what is the, what are the goals? What are the plans for the company? And then what is the objective reality that we're experiencing on the front lines? Cause I find when you, if you get a disconnect between those two, you, you turn a planning episode or into basically, you know, fiction writing. And, and yeah, I would, I would say you want to avoid academic exercises. Right. So that's great in school. It's not that useful in, in, in practice. Right. You want to make sure that you account for reality and be pragmatic as you think about your ICP. Totally. I want to I want to ask, you know, a little bit more about your process here. But first, like, what's the downside of doing this wrong? Right. Of, of not not getting this exercise right. Right. We talked a little bit about your experience at Cladera, but, you know, can yeah. you tell me about some other companies you might have seen? Yeah, and again, I've, I've had the chance to do this for multiple companies uh, since Cloudera from a consulting capacity, and it's it's consistent. There's pattern recognition there as to what the output is. So, so as I mentioned in the beginning, this is the rudder of your ship if you're a sales organization as a ship. So if you get this wrong, in the beginning, you're, you're fortunate, right? You have the ability to adjust, tune, and refine pretty quickly. 
right? But when you get to the size of $100 million or whatever it may be, it becomes nearly impossible to make that, make a significant pivot here. But also, if you think about this from a planning cycle standpoint, because that's how I think about it, right? Uh, when I'm about to start a new fiscal year as a sales operator, I allocate typically around three months the year prior to build out our planning structure and process. What does that mean? Defining your target market, defining your sales model, i.e. is it hunter, farmer, is it inside or outside reps, things like that. Defining your coverage model, sales engineers, inside sales, what's the ratio, things like that. Uh, quota allocation and balanced territories. Those are the five big components of that planning cycle. If you think about it, four out of those five are in fact dependent on your target market. If you don't have the right target market, it's going to be really hard to balance territories, right? If you don't have the right target market, it's going to be really hard to hit the right quota attainment for your sales team. It's going to be really hard to decide the right sales model, things like that, right? If you think your target market is the biggest companies in the world, you're likely not using an inside sales model. If you think it's transactional and it's in smaller companies, SMB space, maybe you do use an inside sales transactional volume centric model. Point is, it's almost like it's the dependency for all the other actions that you typically do in that planning cycle. So getting this first part right, um, I mean, it's maybe it's a little bit extreme for me to say, it's almost an existentialist activity. In other words, if you do not get this right, it can be make or break for your company long term. Right. To the two millions of dollars. It, it reminds me that just the way you're sort of talking about it reminds me of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I almost butchered the word hierarchy there for a second there. It's like, oh, come on, get it right. Maslow's. <laughs> but it's, it's a pyramid, right? It's, yeah. you know, and it sounds like the having a strong definition of what is that target market it is sort of the foundation. Because um, if you're building it on the wrong foundation, it doesn't matter how great you are at all of these things. If you've got, you know, a hundred, a hundred reps and they all have the wrong territories or territories where they're never going to be able to hit quota, yeah. raise your hand. If you've had a friend, if you've been that person, you know, in an organization or you've got a friend that's like currently like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm the number one rep, but the number, you know, the last rep, you know, it puts in the exact same amount of work as I do, but they just have a crappy territory. Yeah. And you know what that ends up being? And just talking from an analytical standpoint, I use this notion as well. So I'm always looking at attainment information for my sales teams. And if you do this wrong, you get a, frequently you get this notion of a bimodal attainment curve. And by that, I mean, it's feast or famine. You'll have a few salespeople that got the best accounts. They tripped and fell into them, or maybe they were early days. Who knows, right? They got the great accounts and they're 150, 200% of number. The rest of your field folks are 30% or less because they didn't, right? It's that balancing of territory has never really happened because again, you just didn't have enough, uh, enough to work with in terms of your target market. So absolutely, in practice, you do see that and it is, nothing is more painful than realizing you're in that feast and famine mode because think about it. The folks that are feasting are gonna stick around, they'll be happy, that's great. The ones that are in the famine world, they're gonna trip, they're gonna go to other companies they're going to talk about the prior company they were at and where they weren't able to make any money. And so when you try to hire new salespeople, it just, they talk to each other. I mean, the sort of uh, the, the impact that happens from something as simple as defining your target market, it's, it's almost shocking how, how uh, significant it can be. I've seen it so many times where sales leaders, they don't want to touch things because they have this golden group of these top reps that they, they sort of put on this pedestal and they're like, well, they're 200% of quota and, and everybody else is at 30% of you know, quota. It's like, well, they have the top 1% of consumer. Why? Exactly. It's not like they're superhuman. I mean, some reps are superhuman and good for you. You work harder, you're smarter, you're better than everybody else. And you absolutely deserve that. But you'll be able to grind that same amount of success out of the out of an average territory as opposed to just like milking the number one territory and okay. having all the best accounts in one. Because as a human, you can only handle so much. And there is a point at which we need to sleep and eat and not be at work in order to, to actually function. And so yeah. you, you actually need to balance it out. Totally with you. Cool, man. So let's talk about this, uh, this process around your, your target market. You've got, uh, I know you've got some, got a bit of a framework here. Yeah, and so I'll, I'll walk this, in, it's almost two phases right, as to how I think about defining your target market. And again, when I'm saying defining your target market, Colin, I'm really referring to defining your ideal customer profile. So the first half of the equation is defining it in a qualitative sense. Okay. Once you've done that, then the second half of it is really 
what data can you use, not just today, but one quarter from now, one year from now, two years from now, to validate or refute the hypothesis you have in place? I'd love for us to get to a point long term where we can use machine learning and the system can tell us what our target market is and we don't have to do any of these things. But the reality is that just sales operations isn't there right now. The sample set isn't there right now. So this is the approach you have to take. You have to start qualitative and then you have to supplement and again, refute or, or validate with data. So let's talk about the first half of the equation, which is again, the qualitative. And again, we talked about this earlier. A lot of folks just throw up their hands when they're thinking about the target market and say, it's just too complex, we're a snowflake, there's no one right answer, that sort of thing, right? That's not necessarily the case. If you think about it in three, I like to, to bring up three particular groupings, there's really four that uh, I typically use, but three of them are really easy to comprehend. The fourth one is somewhat polarizing, so let's talk through it. The first one is I always have uh, my stakeholders, those five to seven stakeholders talk about what are the firmographic details that you think would be relevant to our target market. Firmographic, demographic, it's the same thing. Essentially, the way I like to look at it is it's stuff that you can get out of a curated database easily. So it's annual revenue, it's industry, it's IT spend, it's employee count, things like that. So information that is consistent and readily available um, for you through other technologies. Okay, so have that conversation. What are those attributes that you're seeing in the trenches as a salesperson, or you're seeing macro level in the data, or you just start sensing through being a part of the deal desk team as to what constitutes a good customer for us, right? What's been a high value customer for us? So firmographic is usually important. That one's usually the easiest. Most people have that locked and loaded and have a sense of what that looks like. The other two that I'm gonna bring up are perhaps a little bit more complex but also starting to get easier as you think about the data availability we have. One of them is behavioral. So a great example is at Cloudera, we knew that we had intent data from our potential prospects. So folks doing things on our website and uh, let's say they were downloading a bunch of our open source connectors. It was all from Acme Corporation. Okay, great. Usually that's a really good indication that their propensity to buy is going up, right? So using things like that, hugely important in defining your target market. It can't just be purely uh, uh, purely demographic. You have to include things that are behavioral. The benefit here, Colin, is this is proprietary internal data in most companies, right? So nobody else has access to it. You have access to it. So that is your, your, your value add as a company, right? So looking into your data, typically in marketing automation, to see what sort of activities are potential prospects at the very top of the funnel doing, and how is there a correlation between that and potentially the end state, which is booking a large deal, okay? And then the third one is technographic. Technographic, I'd say five years ago, I threw my hands up and said, this is kind of uh, voodoo magic. There's nothing here that we can really use. Now it's becoming really relevant. And by technographic, all I'm, I'm suggesting is, what's the existing install base that this potential prospect has? Do they have complementary technologies to yours? already in place? Do they have competitive technologies to yours already in place, right? Um, are there upsell opportunities because you, again, are using some other potential uh, uh, product offering within the company? The point here is we want to see what sort of install base is within these customers already and use that as a predictor to potential for that propensity to buy conversation. The good news is, again, when you think about, say, Discover or Data Nice, there's a few different companies out there that do this, actually quite a few now, which basically have a field within their tool that says, what's the install base? What, what is that customer, that particular account using today in terms of technology? I just did this for a company recently in the Valley. It was really easy to find those, uh, those, those uh, values within these curated databases. And then again, if you have that information at the tip of your fingertips, which you do now, it makes your, your ideal customer profile even more robust. So I'll stop there for a second because the reality is you, it, you don't need to cure world hunger here. If you can just focus on those three major attributes, the fourth one is psychographic, which is more kind of soft. I'm not gonna get too deep into that because most, most folks throw their hands up. But if you go in and focus on these three sort of groupings, I, you can get really far along in defining your ideal customer profile before even touching a lick of data within your organization.
Gotcha. And so this is, you're pulling from these external sources. You're also pulling from your internal sources of, you know, what's happening in my Salesforce and my Marketo on our website. What are the, what are, what are our customers doing? What have they, what have our experiences been so far? And you're trying to match that up with the, the databases that you have available and said, okay, let's try and find some common ground here. Bingo. And right. Tools like Bombora, which do intent discovery, things like that. I mean, they're, they're, gold mines for this sort of information too, from a behavioral capacity. It doesn't necessarily have to be stuff that's directly in, in Marketo or sales, uh, salesforce.com, right? There's all these sort of complementary technologies that are also bubbling up that are trying to solve similar uh, problems. So again, hugely valuable in my mind to go down this path. And then the next step, as I was saying is, it's not about waking up the very next day and saying, now let's run a bunch of data analytics on, on our ICP. Because again, typically you do the qualitative exercise because you don't have the ability to do the quantitative exercise. The next step here is let's go build that infrastructure in place. If I am again, a five to seven person company, build the systems infrastructure in place so that one, two, three quarters from now, when you've actually gotten some bookings in place based on your target market, can we go back and reanalyze our target market? Can we make sure in, that our hypotheses that we had in the beginning through this exercise, if they are still valid? Because think of it this way. If you're an early stage company, by the time you hit one year in into your run rate, your fundamental target market may have changed. Your product market fit may have changed. A lot of things may have changed along the way. So to, do, to set yourself up to continually assess and refine your target market through data is the next step in this equation. And to me, that's the... That's nirvana. That's the holy grail if you can do it. We got lucky. We at Cloudera, we were selling machine learning and advanced analytics solutions. So we were able to eat our own dog food and do some really cool things around this part of the exercise. But it's not something exclusive to Cloudera. This is something companies can do even if you just have data within Salesforce and Marketo, for instance, or Salesforce and Eloqua. Uh, there's a lot you can do right then and there. And the smaller you are, the, the more, I think the less academic you need to be about it, right? You're not going to, as a two person sales team, you're not going to go sprinkle some machine learning sauce on it and expect it to, you know, turn out miracles. You, you probably just need to sit down and have a conversation with the two people that are closing for you. You got it. You got it. It's as simple as that. And, and think of it this way, your CRM also has some very basic data points that you can get from day one that are very insightful. Right. So, so, so the way that I like to put it is what we just talked about so far, whether it's firmographic, behavioral, technographic, what we're talking about, if you just think from a BI standpoint, business intelligence standpoint, those are dimensions, right? Those are attributes. On the other half of the equation is you have measures, right? So what are the, the KPIs that you're going to measure against uh, those attributes against, right? Uh, so for early stage companies, it may just be as simple as close rates, and you, you know, ACV and uh, uh, ASP, so average sales price. It may just be those three measures. And let's just go see which of our attributes that we define have our staff ranked at the top on those three measures. Longer term for folks like myself at Cloudera, what we were able to do is we were able to do things like cost of acquisition analysis, CAC payback analysis. We were able to start tracking activity of our sales team and correlate it with which accounts they're spending their time, effort, energy around and, and back into, again, all those more sort of granular details about what the cost is of our salesperson versus the amount of dollars they bring back. So you can get real complex with this, but start simple. You have data today in your CRM that is hyper valuable to you, and you'll be surprised how far along you get just with that data before you even have to worry about the more complex ML, AI, all that stuff. That's I mean, that's aspirational and most companies don't get there. You don't need to worry about that. Paralysis is the thing you need to worry about, Colin. A lot of people stand back and say, boy, I don't know all the details on how to get my ICP in place, so I'm just not going to worry about it. That's the worst thing you can do. Use what you have and get sort of be evolutionary, not revolutionary in your process. Gotcha. And so you're recommending start small, especially on the quantitative side. Yeah. If you're a smaller company, we're looking at close rates. We're looking at the you know, the ACV, the ASP, sort of well, and, 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 lifetime, basically. Exactly. And I correlated it similar to how do we think about forecasting, right? So there was a long time where Salesforce.com itself, who are right there, the paragon of, they used to say, we care about five fields when we think about forecasting, closed date, stage, forecast category, probability, 
I'm sorry, amount and next steps, right? Next step was the only qualitative field. They scale their business, at least that's what's been said, from zero to a billion dollars using just those five fields. Why? It wasn't because they had all this information. It's because they refined focus and they were persistent. So meaning they were continually asking those questions throughout. It's no different with the target market. Don't worry about all the data. Worry about a small subset of data that you can control and be consistent with and iterate continually. So come back every quarter. You got to, you know, sales does quarterly business reviews. Operations should be doing business reviews as well, but they're doing it more again on, on things like this. So analyze and reanalyze on a quarterly basis and you're starting to build trends. When you start to build trends, it doesn't matter how many data points you have, trends are more relevant. Put that in place, you'll be surprised how much insight you get and how quickly you can get it. I'm pr- probably going to get this wrong, but I want to say it was Brad Feld back in the day. I remember reading posts of his saying, you know, there's dots and there's lines, right? Mm-hmm. And every single incident, you know, you're just looking at a dot. And what we're really looking for is a line. And really, you need yeah. three data points to start to, to actually see a line. Yeah. I just remember thinking that. And I think his, he was talking about something totally, totally different, you know, entrepreneurs proving themselves. But I yeah. think the analogy applies here is it's so easy to just sit and look in your CRM and say, okay, well, this is where we are today. Right. And think, yeah. okay, well, I can just apply this out to the rest of our, our life as a company yeah. when it's not, it's a dot and you need to connect multiple instances of these in order to actually learn something from it. Yeah. That's how you get context. I'm with you hundred percent. Great, man. And so you've got a bit of a cheat sheet that you're going to share with us so we can have some, uh, so anybody that's listening that, uh, that wants to sort of re-up and have a look at, you know, maybe you can dive a little bit deeper, see what uh, Kern means by psychographic. You can look at that. You can see sort of how detailed he got. It's nice and simple, two pages. It's great. Um, we'll throw a link to that in the show notes. You can have a look now, grab it, just a simple Google Doc. Um, I did want to, you know, I, I promise everybody a chance to sort of pitch themselves um, on the show. And I, I do it in the most sales way I think we possibly could. <laughs> I'm going to pick up my phone. We're going to do a cold call role play. I like it. And I'll, I'll preface this with, I'm an operator, not a salesperson. So I'm going to give you my best college try here. But <laughs> Let me just take note of all these, all these excuses and reasons why. Yeah, exactly. Hey, we haven't started the cold call yet. So, yeah. <laughs> so who, what's, what's your target market? Who, who am I going to be in this? Uh, set the stage for me a little bit. Who are you calling? Yeah, so our target market is primarily enterprise B2B organizations. So okay. in the Valley, we certainly, we specialize in the technology uh, vertical. Um, so, so likely to be an individual in that range. Um, in terms of size, I mean, we've gone anywhere from Series A, uh, early stage companies, all the way to Series C, D, and beyond. So size isn't important because, again, we've seen the whole life cycle. Gotcha. But uh, uh, really, our focus is B2B technology companies. Okay. And then who do you tend to be selling to? Who am I going to be today? So uh, we tend to sell to the CRO within okay. uh, a, a given organization occasionally in sales operations, but let's, uh, let's make this difficult for me. Let's make you the CRO. Great. All right. You ready? I'm, I'm ready, brother. Nervous? <laughs> <laughs> All good. I'm going to send this to Lars afterwards. Be like, Hey man, can you score this uh, call for me? I feel like I'm in new hire training. Perfect. Ring, ring. Hey, this is Colin. Hey, Colin. This is Karen saying, do you have uh, 10 minutes to chat? And I'm the CRO of this very large, very busy company. I don't have 10 minutes. Call again tomorrow. <laughs> so that was a bad start, right? <laughs> uh, so right. Colin, I uh, appreciate you getting on the phone with me. I, I wanted to just take a few minutes and give you a little bit of an overview of, of my consulting firm, which I think could be really valuable to you and your company as you think about scaling out your sales organization and uh, your sales operations function. Do you, have a, do you have one minute for me? I can give you one minute, but I don't think I really need that. I'm the CRO here. Why would I need your help? Well, so the reality is that, again, as a CRO, you probably understand this better than most. Um, You have massive targets ahead of you. You have great growth that you need to achieve and you have a board that you need to appease, right? And one half of the equation certainly is for you to hire more salespeople and, and, and try to grow your revenue that way. But the reality is you want to build a sustainable business, Colin. And so to do that, you need to have the right infrastructure in place. You need to have the right methodology, the right process, and just as importantly, the right scalable technologies so that your salespeople spend as little time as possible doing the menial work and spend more time selling 
and selling efficiently so that they are in fact giving you the most bang for their buck. And uh, that's something we can help with. So our, our company, Colin, is we, we specialize in both inside sales and revenue operations. We've been doing this for large hyper growth companies for many years in our past lives, uh, all the way from early stage to IPO and beyond. So we've, we've seen what that growth pattern looks like. We know when you need to install what aspects of sales operations, inside sales, and how you need to go do it. And if you do this right, it can help you be sustainable, help you scale. And uh, that's what we want to help you do. And so love to spend a little bit more time talking with you about what that looks like, because I think it can be of great value to you. Nice work, man. It sounds good. <laughs> Give you a bit more leeway on the call than I normally would, but uh, I think that was good, man. I, you know what? I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> cool. Hey, I really want to thank you for coming on the show. This was, this was so much fun. If people want to get in touch with you, if they got questions about the show, if they're like, hey, I want to hire this guy or hire his company, how can they, get into, how can they reach you? So certainly you can uh, go on our website. It's uh, www.salessource.com. And you can learn a lot more about us, our client testimonials, what we do, our service offerings. Um, if you somehow feel like you need to reach me directly, you can certainly reach me via email as well. It's Curran, K-A-R-A-N at salessource.com. And uh, happy to dig in with anyone who has uh, uh, an appetite to learn more. Right on. Thanks again. Um, just for everybody that's, that's listening now, um, big shout out to Curran. This was awesome. I wonder if you could do us a favor. We've got, we've got a bit of a competition going on, a bit of a challenge this, this month. What we're looking for is give us a, a thumbs up or subscribe on YouTube. Give us a five-star rating on iTunes. And we're, gonna ent we're entering everybody that does that into a draw. We're going to send away, uh, send off 10 signed copies of Impossible to Inevitable. Um, Aaron's got a new version coming up in May, but we're sending out the, uh, the old ones while you can get them. And then we're going to also continue that later. So if you shoot a, a screenshot to a podcast at Predictable Revenue of anything that you've done, whether it's a tweet, subscribe, uh, or a rating on iTunes, great or terrible, whatever you feel like we deserve, shoot us a picture of that and uh, you'll enter yourself into that draw. All right. Curran, thanks again for coming on the show, man. This is great. You got it, Colin. See you, bud.